welcome to Perusia World Spotlight with Matthew Herman Taig on the Perusia Podcast Network. Perusia World Spotlight is produced in partnership with EWTN Asia Pacific and Voice of Charity Radio Australia. In the spotlight today is Matthew Leonard, Catholic author, speaker, and host of the Art of Catholic podcast. Hello, Matthew Leonard, and welcome to Perusia World. It's great to be with you, Matthew, and everyone else on uh, your side of the pond, as it were, and anyone else joining from around the world. It's great to be with you guys. Yeah, well, I really do want to thank you for uh, giving us some of your time today. Um, we've already done a podcast with you. We did. Uh, you were interviewed by Shaba Raish and, and gave us your testimony for Perusia Podcasts. Uh, but it's an absolute honor that I get to speak with you today because I discovered you through your work with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. So then when I finally got into the podcast world, your name was one of the ones I searched. And in fact, your podcast, The Art of Catholic, was the very first Catholic podcast that I started listening to. So this is a real joy for me. Well, it is an honor to be with you as well, and I'm humbled that uh, I was your first foray into Catholic audio in that in that kind of a venue. So thanks be to God. Yeah, thanks be. And I really do want to highlight your podcast for our listeners. So if anyone uh, anyone out there who comes into contact with Parisia, and if you, you do hear this podcast, please check out The Art of Catholic by Matthew Leonard. It's, it's, it's really an amazing podcast and well worth your time. And uh, there was a couple of recent episodes. How many? You, you're up to about 114 episodes yeah, now. That, that's exactly right. I think you're yeah. spot on. Yes. Okay. And some of your recent episodes uh, I found to be absolutely amazing. I think episode 109, you were interviewed uh, by some friends of yours, Fred and Cara, and that was on deep prayer and the meaning of redemptive suffering, wasn't it? It was. And uh, I think a lot of times we forget that there's such a relationship between the, the life uh, of the spirit and moving deeper into relationship with the Lord and what that means to the suffering that we experience. Because as we move, and this is one of the things we've talked about, uh, Matthew, is that when you move into a deeper relationship with the Lord, you start to understand a little more deeply that being conformed to Jesus Christ means you're going to be conformed to everything about him, which includes his suffering. And, uh, and it's a joy to be able to participate in that, as St. James says, and St. Paul talks about as well. And it's a joy because you start to realize, well, this isn't about misery. This is joyful because I'm, I'm being allowed to participate. I'm literally conforming myself to Jesus Christ. And the key principle there is that as love grows, suffering disappears, right? And so, for example, uh, if I, when I first started dating my wife, uh, I would literally go into the girly stores with her, you know, like she needed to shop to buy some, I would never go into those places anymore. Right. But back yeah. then, man, I do anything and it would have been suffering to go there with anybody else. But because I was in love with her and I am in love with her, that uh, it wasn't seen as a, as a suffering anymore. It was seen as an act of love. And that's what happens in our spiritual life. The closer we get to Christ, we view those trials and tribulations that we have in our life as acts of love that we then offer back up to the Lord. Mm. And you mentioned St. James. Uh, and of course, uh, James was the focus of episode 114, where you interviewed Shane Kepler on the epistle to St. James. And boy, was that a kick in the pants for any Catholic who's <laughs> attempting the spiritual life. Well, that's exactly right. And that's why I chose James as my confirmation name uh, when I was becoming Catholic about 22 years ago, because he always keeps me on the straight and narrow and is constantly lobbing these bombs at me when I, I think I'm, you know, kind of all that or whatever. James just hits me right between the eyes and reminds me that, that you have to seek after humility with everything you have. You got to watch exactly what you say that, you know, the tongue is a fire and we have to keep our mouths shut as Catholics. And frankly, there's, there's way too much chatter uh, about this and that and the other in the Catholic world. And what we really need to do is kind of quiet ourselves and quiet our tongues, which James says is a fire and will lead us astray. And we need to focus on our interior life. And that's one of the things that James really makes clear. And it's why I love the book of James. Yeah, well, 
my middle name is James. So I think likewise, nice. I need to spend quite a bit more time in the epistle of St. James. So thank you for that episode. Uh, and of course, there's another episode that I, I just can't help uh, pointing out, which was episode 113. Uh, on Archbishop Fulton Sheen, where you interviewed a mutual friend, Alan Smith, uh, which was just another brilliant episode and well worth people's time. Uh, you have a you have a bit of a love of Sheen yourself, don't you? I do. In fact, Alan was so nice. You can see behind me, uh, I've got some relics that Alan sent me uh, of of Archbishop Sheen. And of course, as a Protestant growing up, I never heard of Archbishop Sheen. We, he just wasn't even on my radar because by the time I came of age, you know, his, his time had already passed, so to speak. But when I discovered him after becoming Catholic, holy moly, I mean, what an amazing, amazing communicator, but not just a communicator. When I was, uh, one of the things I do is I, I lead pilgrimages as well. And I was on pilgrimage, uh, the priest that was assigned to my bus a couple of years ago when I was in the Holy Land was the, the man, the priest who actually erased the blackboard for Fulton Sheen on his television show. And so he knew him intimately and lived with him for years. And he told me that the very first night that he was with Sheen, he thought he was going to um, impress him as a young uh, priest. And that he was going to get up really early and beat Sheen, you know, and show him that how you know good he was. He got down to the Adoration Chapel and Sheen was already there. And Sheen started every day deep in prayer. And I really think that that was the key to what a dynamic evangelist that he was and all the great things that he did in the Catholic faith. Yeah, I do remember the episode. And I remember, I believe you were on pilgrimage with the Monsignor. That's exactly right. Yeah, he was on my bus. And it was just wow. wonderful. I mean, it was like this, this same uh, Monsignor lived with uh, John Paul II as well. And so it was like, it was like having this direct connection, you know, to these two yeah. saintly men. Uh, it was really incredible. Yeah. And, and you lamented the fact that the, the audio wouldn't be as great as, as your normal level. But I, I thank you deeply for doing it anyway, because that too was a, was a really amazing interview. So thanks for that. Yeah, it was my pleasure. God, God is really good. And the more we talk to people who are striving for holiness, the more it rubs off on us. And that's why we got to do it. Because that's what it's all about, isn't it? This, this universal call to holiness. And this is, this is also why, not only why you do your work, but why you pursue it yourself, right? Uh, this is not something you simply talk about. You're actually walking the walk, aren't you? I'm doing it the best I can, right? And uh, I think that's the uh, that's the key for all of us because it's so easy to to fall into the trap of thinking there's no way I can be that holy. There's no way I can ever become a saint. But the reality is, the only people in heaven are saints, and this is the path that Jesus laid out for us. He says in Matthew five forty eight, "Be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect." And it's this life of holiness that's laid out for us by Holy Mother Church is is the path of life i mean jesus says this is the one thing necessary nothing else really matters at the end of the day it doesn't matter what are the things you memorize and you can recite this and you taught that class where it doesn't matter what matters is whether or not we have a relationship with jesus christ and the only way that we can make that happen is by moving down the path toward unity with him divine intimacy that is the name of the game and at the end of the day that's the only thing that matters and jesus himself tells us that wow and this really brings us to the the focus of your current ministry and it's called the science of sainthood uh now i'm a bit of a science nerd uh done a bit of science myself so uh, i'm a bit confused by the title matthew leonard are you truly telling me that the path to holiness and sainthood is a science. I'm only repeating the words of the saints who have gone before us because, you know, I have to admit the first time I saw that I was like, well, the science, it kind of just robs it of life almost. Right. But the reality is that St. Augustine called it the science of saints. And that's kind of, that's where I got the title. And he's not the only one. St. Catherine of Siena calls it a holy science and other saints have talked about it as well. And it's a science only in the sense that it is a laid out path for us to follow. Uh, this is something growing up Protestant, I just didn't have, uh, you know, and I think a lot of Catholics kind of fall into this same kind of a, a lifestyle where we, we think that we're just supposed to tread water in the spiritual life. 
we stay in a state of grace and we really hope and pray that we're in a state of grace when Jesus comes back or we die, whichever one comes first. And as long as that happens, you know, then everything's going to be okay. And, that, and the church says, no, what we're supposed to be doing, if, if there's a goal to where we are going, and it is heaven, and it's not just some, you know, cool place up in the sky with half naked cherubs strumming on harps, but it's really deification and joining ourselves to, all, to Almighty God. If that's the goal, being united to Him, that goal starts now. It's not something that starts later. We don't live two lives, one now and one later. You got one life to live, and we are on this path. And there are road markers in this path to God. And this is what the science of sainthood is really all about. There is a natural progression in the spiritual life. So just like you grow up in, in the natural life, you grow up in the supernatural life from infancy to adolescence and on into adult spiritual, um, the adult spiritual life. This is how St. Thomas Aquinas talks about it. So all of the science of sainthood and this growth process goes deep, deep, deep into the tradition of the church and even find uh, you know some language about it in sacred scripture when saint paul talks about you know becoming perfect and such and so uh it this is something that when i came across the science of sainthood i realized this is it like mm -hmm. this gave pinpoint direction to my spiritual life and i was no longer treading water i was diving under the surface into the beautiful life of grace that's there waiting for us wow and so what you what you and the saints are actually saying that that this is a science. Therefore, <laughs> thanks for lumping. Thanks for lumping me in there, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> but you, you're telling us that there's there's actually there is actually a method to this. There's a method that everyday Catholics can follow. That this is this is not something that is offered to just a few, but really to all. Oh, preach it, uh, because if there's this is something that Catholics need to understand that when you read about the lives of the saints and you see the heights of holiness that, to which they, they climbed, that isn't a life just for them. It's not like they're aliens hanging on the, you know, the, the sides of church walls looking down on the rest of us. Those are real people who lived real lives just like us. And all we read is the highlight reel you know, in, in the saint books that we have. But they dealt with the same things that, that we do. And if they can do it, then we can do it. And the reason why is because every single bit of it is fueled by grace. Now, it still means we, you know, we have a part to play. And that's what the science of sainthood is. It is recognizing what we need to do and then making acts of the will to actually do it. But it's all empowered by grace, and it is a life to which every single one of us is called. It doesn't matter your state in life. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been Catholic or not. You are called to be a saint, and this is exactly what Jesus expects, and it's exactly what the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do. Wow. I think this is potentially mind-blowing for a lot of Catholics because this isn't something that we hear about these days, is it? No, unfortunately not. I mean, and, and some of it is... Look, I didn't hear about this um, just so people don't feel bad about themselves in case they're thinking like, man, I've never heard of the science of sainthood or anything like that. I didn't really encounter the, the nuts and bolts of this until I've been a Catholic for a decade. And I traveled a pretty uh, theological road into the church. I read my way in, in many respects. And it's just not talked about. I, I'm not, I've asked around. I'm not exactly sure why, uh, to be honest. But if you've noticed, uh, it's really hard for people to find spiritual directors these days. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's so difficult oftentimes for people to find them is because the spiritual theology of the science of sainthood uh, kind of uh, was taken out of the seminaries about 50 years ago. It just wasn't focused on anymore. Now it's starting to make a comeback here in the States. I don't know what it's like you know, in other parts of the world. Slowly, 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 uh, it's coming back. Uh, but we haven't talked about it, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure why. I haven't looked into the history of it, but I think we're so concerned that good Catholics, I mean, even good Catholics, are trying to get to Mass. They're going to confession. They're saying their prayers. But they're unaware of the fact that there is a method to the, I don't want to call it the madness, but the saintliness <laughs> of, of making progress in the spiritual life. But once you see it, and once it's laid out for you, it literally is a road that we travel and the mass and, and the other sacraments and the life of prayer. Those are the vehicle 
that travel the road of the science of sainthood, of the stages of the spiritual life that every one of us is going to go through, regardless of whether or not you even know about them. I mean, we're, we're going down this road already, Matthew. And, mm -hmm. and it's a whole lot better to know what you're actually doing so you can make more progress. Okay, so it sounds like prayer is an essential component to this. Now, in, in, as anyone who has listened to my testimony and my, my follow-up talk knows that I talk often about the hierarchy of prayer, that we have this thing called the hierarchy of prayer. Right at the top is the liturgy, and it kind of comes in two parts. You've got the holy sacrifice of the mass and then the liturgy of the hours. And then the next level down is this thing called Lexio Divina. And then under that is devotional prayer. Of course, the queen of the devotional prayers is the rosary. And then extempore prayer or, or prayers in our own words or spontaneous prayers. And right at the top, it's a, it's a kind of a bottom up uh, approach, isn't it? We're, we're joining the mission of Christ, which is first and foremost to glorify the father and then to sanctify his people. And that's what liturgy is all about. But then we hit stuff like Lexio Divina and devotional prayer and then extemporary prayer. And uh, so where, where does the science, where, do, where does your method fit within this hierarchy of prayer, Matthew? Well, you certainly cannot. I mean, you, first of all, you're spot on, obviously. I mean, you can't separate prayer and the spiritual life. They go together hand in glove. And you read any of the saints, especially the spiritual masters, and most of what they talk about is prayer. And the more and more I've studied this over the last decade, the more I'm convinced, Matthew, that really growth in the prayer or growth in the spiritual life and making your way down through the stages of the spiritual life, or I should say up through the stages of the spiritual life is really nothing more than an intensification of your life of prayer. Mm. I mean, really, because if prayer is our relationship with God, right? The deeper that goes, the more unified you are to him, which is the goal. And kind of stepping back, I would think a little bit from the hierarchy of prayer that you're talking about would be the, the three main modes or states of prayer in Catholicism. So vocal, meditative, and contemplative prayer. And lots of times we see in, in some of the hierarchical uh, parts of prayer, like you're talking about, we'll see a combination of of vocal, meditative, and contemplative prayer. So for example, in the liturgy, you're right, the liturgy is the highest form of prayer because it's where the family of God comes together and all things being equal, that is the highest form of prayer because it's, it's in the liturgy, right? This is where heaven and earth kiss. Yeah. Uh, but we have vocal prayer in it. But when you're really focused on vocal prayer and you're really thinking about what you're saying, which you have to for it to really yeah. be prayer, you have to be focusing on what you're talking about, right? Otherwise, you're just babbling like the pagans, as Christ mm -hmm. says. But when you're really focused, you are then, in a sense, being brought into meditation, which is really just an interior prayer and a conversation between you and God. And to be perfectly honest, and Lexio Divina fits into this meditation category as well, although it ends in contemplation. A lot of people don't think about this, but all of, when you look at Guigo the Carthusian, who wrote the, the classic work on Lexio Divina, uh, called the, the ladder of monks, it, it ends in contemplation. And it's a beautiful, it's actually kind of a little microcosm of what happens in uh, the life of prayer for every Catholic, because we all know vocal prayer, like we, you've been saying Hail Mary since before conception for most Catholics, right? But then meditative prayer is something that isn't other, this is something we have to start doing right now. Like, when you finish listening to this show, start meditative prayer. I mean, like right away, because this is the one thing that Catholics, if, if more Catholics were entering into meditative prayer, we wouldn't have a lot of the issues that we have. And it, certainly we would all be a lot more personally holy. But meditative prayer is really just a, um, it's attentive reflection on our Lord that's aided by some kind of a spiritual input. So you mentioned Lexio Divina, right? So basically we're reading and praying over sacred scripture. It's an interior conversation between me and God, where that Bible is my input into that conversation with the Lord. So it's quiet prayer and you're reading through it and something pops off the page to you, you know, and, and you meditate on it and then you pray about it, but it ends in contemplation. And this is something that a lot of Catholics miss. So vocal, meditative and contemplative prayer in vocal and meditative prayer, we're the impetus. I start talking to God, I get my Bible and start reading and meditating on it. All of that is preparation.
or contemplative prayer, which is the highest form of prayer, particularly with regard to personal prayer. And it's something that God does to us. And so the, the more you practice for and get ready for contemplation, what happens when contemplative prayer hits is that it, it's all God, like only God can make it happen. There is a lot of confusion about this in the Catholic world. Lots of people think that they can kind of center down and they can, you know, just jump in and out of contemplative prayer. That's not the case at all. That goes in the face of 2000 years of church teaching. You prepare for contemplative prayer with vocal and meditative prayer, uh, meditative prayer. But once you get there, it's all God. And he literally begins to pour himself into you. It's called infused contemplation because it comes from the Latin word infusum, that which is poured in. So vocal, meditative, and contemplative prayer, those three main modes of prayer that overlay what you are talking about, so to speak, with the, with the hierarchy of prayer. And this really is, it, it, it's kind of like a ladder to God when you look at the modes of prayer. And uh, you'll continue most likely to do all three of them at any given time, even as you progress in the spiritual life. But it really is the bedrock of your movement toward God. Wow, uh, this is some really deep stuff. Now, uh, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> a couple of years ago, um, I got very attracted to the uh, Benedictine spirituality, and I, I became good friends uh, with a priest uh, who's a um, who's a, a, a Benedictine hermit. Um, uh, at, probably the most social hermit uh, you've ever met we we have a we have a, a blind lady in the parish who, who will often say that uh, father ronan kilgannon is as much a hermit as she is a formula one race driver uh, but he's, he's definitely a, a, a man of this and it was he who introduced me to the benedictine spirituality and i i became so attracted to it i became a, a benedictine oblate so a third order benedictine and as part of that, I promised to, to, to try and pray Lords and Vespers, so that's morning prayer and evening prayer from the Liturgy of the Hours every day and do Lexio Divina every day. And if there's, and, and I'll freely admit that right, right at the moment, my prayer life's a bit of a mess, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment, but uh, every single day, if there's one of those types of prayers that I drop, it's Lexio Divina because it's the one I find really difficult so as you say it's a it's a, a slow and quiet prayerful reading of scripture um i i try and use the the gospel of the day but all too often i read it and nothing pops off the page what advice would you give me this is something a lot of people uh, experience in the spiritual life and so this is one of the reasons why the stages of the spiritual life are so important to understand and I think I, I might have briefly mentioned them before, but this kind of growth process in the spiritual life, where we move from what the church fathers will call the purgative to the illuminative and the unitive ways. And really those are just 25 cent words that mean going from spiritual infancy to adolescence and spiritual adulthood. But what you find is when you study this first stage, this purgative way, is that in the very beginning, when you first have your conversion, typically, now it, everyone's an individual, so the, I'm painting with a broad brush here, but when you first have your conversion, you're super excited, like, this is the greatest thing ever, I, I've had this encounter with God, it's changed my life, and, and prayer flows so easily, and everything's just wonderful, I'm skipping through the daisies with God, right, yep. and then things start to change, and God, it, it you know, it, God starts to pull away a little bit, and this is for people, we're assuming here that people are attempting to make progress in the spiritual life as well. We're not talking about spiritual laziness. Oh, yeah. So uh, you start to feel dry and you sit down to your Lexio Divina and nothing pops off the page at you. And you're like, hey, God, where'd you go? You know, I thought we had something going on here. Mm -hmm. And what's happening at this point is super important because really this is where most people go off the rails uh, in the spiritual life, Matthew. And that is, God is pulling back from us a little bit, it feels like, uh, because what he's really doing is teaching us to grow up, right? He's so like when there are two ways I want to look at this. So I have a, a three year old, Benedict. And when he was a little bit younger, when, when mom walked out of the room, or if I walked out of the room and he didn't know where we were, he got freaked out a little bit, right? You're like, where are you guys? You know? And it's kind of the same thing with us and God at this point. So he's teaching us to grow up, but he's not leaving us alone. 
it feels like he is. This is what John of the Cross calls the dark night of sense. It's the beginnings of the dark night of sense. And we call the dark night of the sense because you're not sensing God as much anymore. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what's really happening is that God is beginning to actually get closer to you. And so John of the Cross will use the analogy of looking at the sun. And if you stare at the sun, Matthew, what happens? It blinds yeah. you, right? Yes, of course. Even though it's this incredible light, it blinds you. And this is what's beginning to happen in your spiritual life. You're not mm -hmm. moving away from God. He's gotten closer to you. It's just that you don't have the spiritual senses yet to actually see that he's moved closer because you're still attempting to feel God through those lower senses that you have, that you were used to using to encounter the presence of God previously. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I do in the science of sainthood to kind of draw this out is I, uh, you know, classically, the, the soul is divided into two parts. You can see this in Thomas Aquinas and other places. And I refer to it as an upstairs and downstairs part of the soul. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, think of a house. So that's where the senses are, you know, and that's how we encounter God in the beginning. We're downstairs in our spiritual house, so to speak, in our soul, and God is communing with us there. But after a while, God wants to draw us to the higher part of our soul where the intellect and the will live. And so he's kind of starting to go up the stairs and we're still running around the downstairs looking for him we're like, hey, God, where are you? You know, but he's inviting us to move to a higher level with him as he's seeking to to uh, he's cleaned up a little bit downstairs. Now he's moving upstairs to get the upstairs straightened out a little bit more. And as you progress in the spiritual life, this is where some of the suffering and some of the, the spiritual pain comes into it because God's straightening things out in your spiritual house and inviting you into this new kind of relationship with him. So that's why you don't sense him uh, at, at this point in the spiritual life. And a lot of people freak out. They're like, oh, no, I must be doing something wrong because I don't feel God anymore. And that it couldn't be further from the truth. If you're seeking the Lord, the one thing you have to remember is you don't stop. You never stop showing up to prayer. So think of it in terms of like if you have a friend that um, really is in need of your presence uh, you go visit them uh, one way or the, even if even if they can't talk, even if you can't talk to someone, right? I mean, just to be with them as they're experiencing suffering or whatever. It's kind of the same thing with God. We just need to show up. Uh, and that shows God. That's an act of the will. In fact, the saints will say that this is actually a, a, a more meritorious act of the will than when things are like going great. Uh, when you're showing up to prayer and you don't feel like it, you are showing the Lord through an act of love, through an act of the will that you desire to be with him and you will put him in front of what you feel or don't feel. So you show up no matter what, knowing that the Lord is working on you in a place that you can't even fathom. You can't feel it because he's working so deeply. So you just keep doing it. And then what happens is eventually you move out of that and he, he reveals himself to you more and more and you reclaim some of that lost sense of his presence, but on a deeper level. And it's even more beautiful after you pass through this night of sense. Wow. And you, you really have cut me to the quick with this because all too often, if, if I neglect prayer or I choose a lesser good over the higher good of prayer, it's all about my feelings. I, I, God's distance from me, or I'm feeling tired, or, you know, I'm, I'm feeling uh, uh, alone and abandoned. And, and what you're saying to me is forget all that. Just show up and do the prayer, no matter what. Yeah, there, there, are the, there used to be these Nike commercials back in the day, you know, just do it. And that's kind of what it's like in the spiritual life. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult for us is because original sin has made us all narcissists. Like if people could see what we were thinking all the time with those little thought bubbles over our heads, like in cartoon strips, they would see that most of the time we're thinking about ourselves, right? And what prayer is doing is shifting your gaze from being interiorly focused on yourself to outward and upward to God. So you're not focusing on your senses and how you feel or don't feel because the deeper you go in the spiritual life, the more you realize it's not about feelings. Those feelings come faster. They'll, they'll come and go faster than like, you know, one of my teenagers with the first set of car keys. I mean, it's here and gone, right? And it's just like in a relationship with, with other humans, you know? I mean, the, the stages of relationships change. And so 
when I first met my, my wife, I mean, I like the butterflies would never go away. I, it was just constant. Right. And now we've been married for 20 plus years. Uh, I love her more deeply than ever. Right. But I don't have that same butterfly sensation that I did when we first met. So the relationship has matured. And so the, the feelings, I know that the feelings don't always matter because I've made this act of the will to love her and we have a relationship at a deeper level. That's what happens in the spiritual life as well. Wow. Now you, you did say something else. You said it's hard. <laughs> Just how hard is it? <laughs> Look, you know, in the beginning, especially, I'll say this when people hear, um, I oftentimes will get asked, you know, what's your, what's your kind of schedule of prayer? And with six kids in the house, um, I have to get up earlier than everybody else. And so that's when I get my hour of prayer in is in the early morning. Oftentimes it's still dark outside, you know, and I have to do that. Um, is it hard? Yeah, it's really hard. I there's lots of times I'm not Superman. I don't really want to get up, you know, and, but I do it and I will get out of bed and I will go down and do it. And after a while, just like everything else, it becomes easier as you do it. But in the beginning, I would tell people, you know, not to bite off more than you can chew that mm -hmm. if you've never entered into a serious relationship with the Lord and you're going to make an act of the will and you're going to start praying, then I say you start with about 15 minutes, because if you try and sit there for an hour, you're just going to give up and walk away because it's really difficult. It goes against everything that's kind of inside of us. It's really fascinating, Matthew, because the reality is you and I are made to pray. Like literally, we are created to pray because we're created for union with God. And prayer is that relationship and union with God. But in the beginning, we've got so many obstacles and distractions and things in our lives that we would rather go outside and dig a ditch than just spend 15 minutes quiet alone with God. And mm. so you have to kind of work through that and you just keep making that act of the will, right? But uh, what happens after a while is the time starts to go like this. Uh, and the reason why it starts to go faster is again, because this is what you are made for. Now, it doesn't mean everything goes smooth sailing from there, because I've just talked about, you know, after a while, you come to this kind of dry period, this arid period that, that the Lord is teaching you to grow up, and you've got to make your way through it. And lots of times people at this point, uh, right before they get to the aridity portion, they'll experience spiritual consolation. So, you know, like little tastes of heaven from above while you're in prayer, even as you're trying to turn away from the things of the world, God will reward you with these little consolations and they're they're awesome right mm -hmm. but there's a danger in focusing too much on those as well because that's just like that's like candy before the feast and as we all know you know our parents taught us you eat too much candy and you ruin your appetite for the feast and that's what happens to a lot of people they focus on these consolations and so when they get to this arid time when they're not feeling the presence of god they give up or they think they're doing something wrong and they just go back to what they did before and it's mm -hmm. super interesting because I don't know if this has happened to you or not. And forgive me if I'm going on too much about this stuff, but, but Matthew, no, no, this, please, please do go on, please. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is the stuff of life guys. I mean, this is it. This is what it's all about. Mm. Um, when you are, uh, you're, you're, you're in the life of prayer and you get these spiritual consolations and such, uh, as you're moving along, you feel like it, when you get to the, the arid times, it feels like you're doing something wrong. And so you go back. But if you persevere through it, um, when you persevere through it, you come to this, the second stage of the spiritual life, okay, it's called the illuminative way. And what you experience in this illuminative way as you press through and you make your way into it is something that's beyond your wildest dreams. And, I, and it's only the second stage of the spiritual life. I mean, it's not, you're not even close to the top. And what you experience as you persevere through is this love that is beyond compare, uh, it, it, that you, you fall so deeply in love with our Lord. And what happens is the Lord begins to work on you in a different way. So in the beginning, you're getting rid of the big sins in your life and you're dealing with, dealing with the big issues and the moral sins and all the rest of that kind of stuff. When you get through the, the, passive purification of the senses of the dark night of the sense god is beginning to pull up the deeper roots of sin the deeper weeds of sin uh, that are in your life and it is something that on one hand 
you're like, I'm so in love with Jesus. And on the other hand, you're like, I am such a wicked man. It's a funny process because the, the more you go into the spiritual life, the more wretched you realize you actually are because we're so full of ourselves from pride. And this whole spiritual process is really exhuming that garbage out of our lives so that we become more humble like Jesus Christ, who though he, you know, he, he's God, he became lower than the rest of us so that we might have the opportunity to, to share in his, his divine life. That's what's really taking place here. It's this, this um, paradox of falling more in love with the Lord and realizing more and more how wretched you are in and of yourself. Wow. And I think it's important to note too that um, uh, the three stages of the, of the interior life is actually a talk that you give. And there is a Lighthouse um, CD of that. And we actually do stock that uh, here in Australia uh, at the Parisia Media Shop. So that's well worth um, checking out. But you are, you are describing my, my spiritual life right here, Matt. So what I came home in 2015 and it was an extraordinary experience of the Holy Spirit that, that finally pushed me over the line. And I did have a lot of those early consolations. And I look back on that, uh, that time, 2015, 2016, and I think I was far holier then. What went wrong? But you're telling me that actually this is, this is a little bit of progress. So even though I've kind of slipped into some of my some of my old ways and I'm still struggling with some of my mortal sins from 30 years worth of ingrained habitual sin, that this is part of the process. It is part of the process. And the, the beautiful thing about it is while we make it sound like hard work and it is, right? I mean, anything good always comes at a cost. Hmm. But at the same time, it's the merciful love of Christ that is propelling us forward. It's the Holy Spirit who is just kind of cradling us in his arms and moving us through this at the same time. And it, so we have a part to play, obviously. And it, and there are times you just don't want to do it. You don't feel like it at all, right? And my encouragement is, especially in those times, make the act of the will and just do it. And if you do that, what you will find is the Lord will reward you so much for that because it's, it's just a, it, you're really making a sacrifice of love because it really, this is what it's all ordered to. We're supposed to be like Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. Hmm. It's self-giving love. And so even in these small ways, when you don't feel like getting out of bed to go pray, when you make the act of will and you say, I will do that for you, Lord Jesus, that's suffering love. You're giving up something good, sleep, for something better, God, eternity, mm -hmm. my salvation, right? And as you repeat this, it's like a muscle that you're working out over and over, and it gets stronger and it gets stronger. But what you discover as you continue down this path is that Jesus wasn't kidding when he said, pick up your cross and follow me. Those crosses never go away. It's not like you're just constantly living in misery. That, that's not the, the point of the spiritual life at all. It's not about misery. As we were talking about previously, it's, it's really an act of love uh, that we are engaging in because the closer you get to the Lord, the more you love him and the more you are willing to sacrifice for him all the way up through the, the final stages of the spiritual life and realize that after you, let me just kind of lay this out for you really quickly. This is the kind of the foundation of the three stages of the interior life that we we're talking about. After you go through the purgative way and then you pass through this dark night of sense that we were talking about, you go on into the illuminative way, the second stage, and realize there are levels within the levels. Okay, so this is all a lifelong process because the spiritual life is a marathon, it is not a sprint. And we don't want to, you know, we don't want to burn yourselves out and run and trying to go too hard, too fast. It's a lifetime process, just like growing up in the natural life. So it takes years to get through these stages, literally. And as you move through the stages of the illuminative uh, way, uh, you realize that there are times that you have even more intense consolations. It's in this stage, actually, in the higher levels of the illuminative way, when you read all the same stories about them levitating and all the rest of that kind of stuff. That happens not in the highest stage. It happens at the upper end of the second stage of the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. 
And then what happens, this transition into the third stage is an intensification of the dark night of sense that you had previously. And this is what John of the Cross calls the dark night of the soul. And so God actually gets closer to you and you lose all sensation of him. It's not that he just feels distant. You don't feel him at all anymore. Mother Teresa experienced this for 40 years. That's unusual. So don't get freaked out about that. But that's what, what's happened again is like the sun is blinded you more. And the Lord has gotten so close to you, you can't see him with your natural senses. And he's still teaching you to see him more interiorly in a deeper way. And eventually you move through this and you move on into the illuminative, or excuse me, the unitive way, which is the highest stage. But what's interesting is if our whole life is ordered to becoming like Jesus Christ and conforming ourselves to him, we're talking about the Jesus Christ who made the greatest act of self-gift on the cross, right? You and I are going to be united to the cross of Christ one way or the other. The dark night of the soul is us being united to the cross of Christ. So this is when, along with Christ, we cry out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right? Because we don't have any sense of his presence anymore at all. Now, we've also built our virtues, right? And so we have this deep hope that is living inside of us. And we know the Lord's going to come through, but we don't feel him at all anymore. And again, this is us being united to the cross of Jesus Christ. A lot of people never get there. And that's why we got purgatory, right? Again, if you're not, re if you're not united to the cross of Christ through suffering love in this life, you will be in the next provided you make it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's far better and far more meritorious to do it now to move through these stages of the spiritual life and grow in holiness and grow in the ability to give of yourself back to the Lord, because I got news for you. You're going to be closer to the Lord in heaven. I mean, we are meriting our eternity right now through the grace of God, but we are meriting our place in heaven. And we want to do everything we can to give of ourselves to the Lord right now. Okay. You are saying that this is for everyone, but Surely, there's, <laughs> surely there are some exceptions. Um, I've already mentioned I've got 30 years worth of ingrained habitual sin. You know, my first addiction at 13 was masturbation and pornography. From 17 to 35, I drank alcoholically. I have the disease of alcoholism. I've been over 14 years sober now. Um, I broke my back in 2004, so I'm a pain sufferer. I, I go to sleep in pain every night and I wake up stiff and in pain every single morning. Um, I'm putting myself through an exercise program that is increasing my pain because I also have sleep apnea and I've had to go through an operation and wear a splint at night to try and give me more sleep, but I've got to shift the fat so that the, the treatment becomes more effective. So I'm also sleep deprived. And then I, I go and I, I, I start volunteering and working for this Catholic apostolate to, to try and give back to the Lord. And then, uh, you know, I'm doing trips to Sydney and I'm always exhausted and I'm, 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 I'm already giving. So that, surely a, a man of, of suffering, a man of sorrows, uh, who's already trying his best is exempt from this life that you're talking about. <laughs> you and I both know what the answer to this is. You're not exempt. But the beautiful thing is, Matthew, is that the suffering that you are going through is part and parcel of your redemption. I mean, this is part and parcel of the spiritual life for you. Because you are suffering these things. And this is the, one of the most beautiful things about the Catholic faith I did not have growing up. And I wish I did, especially as I watched my mom suffer and die from cancer. But this notion of redemptive suffering uh, ties, it dovetails perfectly with what it is we're talking about. If our goal is to become self-giving Catholics like Jesus Christ, those things that you're enduring the awful pain and the struggles that you have, as long as you are uniting yourself to the Lord and giving them back to him, that becomes wind in your spiritual sails and is plowing you through the water at breakneck speed because you're making a gift of yourself just like Jesus Christ. And, and really, this is one of the most powerful things I think, you know, if, if there's one thing we've all heard so many times 
it's that my spouse has left the faith, you know, or my kids have left the faith or whatever it might be, right? And where I you know, pray our novenas to St. Monica, you know, who brought in St. Augustine and we do those kind of, those are all well and good. You have to pray. And St. Monica is a powerful intercessor. Mm. But I would challenge you to this. Mm. And it's hard. I'm going to tell you right off the bat. Um, don't just pray. Make a gift of your body for that person. Right? Because we are a union of body and soul. We're not just spirits floating around. And when we make, we do penances, we do voluntary penances. They don't even have to be big things, but like turn the hot water down a little bit in the shower, say Hail Mary, give up something at dinner, eat something you don't like. Uh, you know, St. Jose Maria Scorva talked about the butter tragedy. You know, this one priest was like, wouldn't put butter on his bread and stuff. And that was a sacrifice for him. So do these little things. And when you do this, you are making a gift of your own body, just like Jesus Christ, right? So you are literally suffering for the sake of another. And it's powerful and it's effective because why? Because the sacraments have united us to Jesus. We're part of the mystical body of Christ. And that's why I didn't have that as a Protestant growing up, right? We didn't have a sacramental theology. I was baptized as just a, you know, a sign of my my belief in Jesus Christ. I didn't view it as something uniting me to the mystical body of Christ. But as Catholics, we know that's what the sacraments do. That's why your suffering, Matthew, is more powerful. In fact, with, with regard to your situation and other, other situations, because everybody has crosses. Nobody gets out of this place without carrying a cross because that is the path to salvation, right? And original sin introduced it. God doesn't make it happen. He allows it but only to the extent that it's good for our salvation. But the spiritual writers talk about when you experience suffering, involuntary suffering, you embrace it and you give it back to the Lord. It's far more meritorious even than the voluntary penances that we do. Why? Because you are conforming yourself to the will of God, just like Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. So there's kind of two parts of this, accept the stuff that happens. Don't complain to the best of your ability. I know it's so hard because I'm a complainer, right? I could do it all day long. You know, we do it, but accept it, give it back to the Lord, and then look for little opportunities to make a gift of yourself a, a little bit more. And again, this isn't about misery. This is about a gift of love to our Lord and Savior who is humiliated, beaten, bloodied, and killed for us mm. right so we're just making a gift of ourselves back to him in the same way out of love mm. but you've mentioned misery and in in a, in a man who is who is going through some some deep sufferings who then reads james and saint paul telling us there's joy in this uh, that seems a really confusing concept where does the joy fit into this the joy comes in from something we were talking about previously with regard to love. And it goes back to the principle we were, we were, I mentioned briefly, and it takes a long time for this to sink in, but as love increases, suffering goes away. That doesn't mean there's no suffering involved, but what it means is your view of it and your willingness to make these sacrifices brings you joy, hmm. right? Uh, if for, for somebody else, if, if a stranger came up to me and was like, hey, can you help me, you know, load my truck for moving? I'm like, oh, dude, I don't, that's, I don't even know you, first of all, and I don't really want to give up my Saturday to do that. But if it was a close friend of mine or a brother or someone like that, there's still pain involved in that because who likes to help people move, right? Nobody does. But I'm making a gift of myself for my brother that I love. I'm going to do it and it's an act of love. And so I'm happy to be able to help him because I love him. That's what it's like in the spiritual life. We rejoice and we count it as joy when we face trials, as James says, because of our deeper love for the Lord. So the key in all of this is you grow in your spiritual life. You get closer to the Lord because the closer you are to him, the more you're going to love him. And the more you see these sacrifices, not as acts of misery, but as acts of love. And realize too, that the reason for this, the mechanism for it, is that we are made to give of ourselves. You are made, Matthew, 
for the divine, self-giving, self-sacrificial family of God. That's the end goal. And that's why as we progress in the spiritual life, we find more and more joy in giving of ourselves and offering up our sacrifices because this is the way we were made to be and we're conforming ourselves to the divine sacrificial family that we were made to be a part of from the very beginning. Wow. And so we've been going through, you know, a lot right now. <laughs> totally. A lot. <laughs> There's been a huge amount of stuff that we've been covering here. Um, but thankfully, uh, this is all expounded upon and laid out in your apostolate, The Science of Sainthood. Please tell us more about that. The Science of Sainthood is what what ignites the passion inside of me. And the reason why is because, again, it's, it's what the saints have laid out for us is the path to God, period. And the science of sainthood itself, practically speaking, is it's an online subscription program where I lay out for people in a series of more than 100 video lessons uh, to date, and I'm still adding them. I lay out, starting with the end goal of what the Catholic mystical life and what deification is all about and what the the, the ridiculous offer that God puts on the table in front of us that we are literally going to be deified. And I set that up and then I start to move through the different stages and explain what they are, like what's the life of grace. I go through the, the, the levels of sin, the seven deadly sins and how you fight against them. Uh, we go through the modes of prayer and explain how to do them and what to look for as you are moving through them. And I lay it all out uh, based on the three stages. And so I'll deal with the virtues, for example, in the second stage of the science of sainthood, because it's the second stage of the spiritual life, the illuminative way, where that really kicks into gear in your life. Uh, and then we deal with the gifts of the spirit, for example, in the unitive way in the last stage, because that's where the spiritual writers talk about it. Because when the gifts of the spirit are really activated, you are much closer to God. And so I lay it all out in a step-by-step, -step, easy to understand, made for regular Joe and Judy Catholic and language you can understand. And it's really, it's everything you should have learned about the spiritual life, but never did. That's mm -hmm. really what it is. And the whole point of it is that you can grow closer to the Lord and you can be set on fire with love for him. And it's not just videos either. So I, I, uh, I have saint passages and there's Lexio Divina passages for reading and praying. And then I write meditations uh, for each one of these as well. So every lesson has that in the science of sainthood. And it is, uh, it transformed my life and it lit the fire inside of me in such a way that it doesn't matter really what I'm talking about on the road as I travel and speak. It always comes back to this because as Christ himself said, it's the one thing necessary this is the path to eternal life. And this is what we need to be shouting. First, we need to imbibe it. We need to do it ourselves. We need to learn it. And then St. Bernard of Clairvaux talks about, it wells up like a reservoir inside of you without ever losing any of its fullness. It overflows into the people around you. And that's how the world is transformed. It starts with us. We, we strive to holiness. We get close to the Lord and it can't help but come out of us and affect other people. So that is what the entire point of the science of sainthood is. And I do it in as easy to explain way as I possibly can. So the Catholics can be set on fire with the love of God. Amazing. And I, I think, I, I hope that this uh, this podcast is listened to by many, and I would say, as as someone in particular who has been procrastinating about getting into the science of sainthood and really giving it a go, I, I think you've absolutely convinced me, and I think you've convinced. I, I hope you've convinced everyone out there that uh, that the science of sainthood and and your apostolate in particular is is pretty much a must for every Catholic if you want to draw closer to God. All right, thank God for technology and the modern world because you can do this from anywhere in the world, right? Yeah, you can. It's it's completely online and you can access it twenty four seven from you know smartphone, a tablet, a computer, whatever. There's even an app, a mobile yeah. app that goes along wow. with it. So, it's a uh, it, it is amazing what technology has done, and we have we really have no excuses. We have so much at our fingertips. With the, the reason why I did this, Matthew, is because I have, if you can see the size of my desk right now, I have stacks of books, you know, that are this high. And there's all these priest manuals and spiritual tomes and all the rest of it. No one's going to read through that stuff 
I mean, I love it. I, I've, I'm just like eating Scooby snacks for me, right? I love this stuff. But what I've done is taken all of the stuff that's in there and I've distilled it into bite-sized chunks that any Catholic can understand and can practically make their way through so they can be closer to God. Wow. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for coming and speaking with, uh, with me this evening. Uh, please thank your wife and children for sharing you with us and giving us the opportunity to talk with you about this stuff. Uh, it's been absolutely amazing. Um, and for, for this fanboy, uh, it's been a, a real treat uh, to chat with you live and to share that conversation with others. Well, it was my pleasure to be with you and God bless the work that uh, Perusia is doing. Uh, you guys are, are really um, at the service of our Lord. And it's great to see other apostolates whose heart is in the right place that are striving to, to help the world be, become Catholic because it's at the end of the day, you know what? It's Christ's church and it is the pearl of great price. And it's worth everything that you have to give and that I have to give because it's conformity and, and it's love of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're all about. And so I applaud the work you guys are doing and I pray the Lord blesses it abundantly. Thank you. Well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to dive in. I'm going to start. I'm going to start the science of sainthood. And how about you and I get together in a, in a month or two after I've uh, been through a few of your videos and, and, we, do, and we do a sort of a, an update. What do you reckon? Would you like to do that? I would love to do that. Be my pleasure. I think that'd be wonderful. Well, once again, Matthew Leonard, uh, thank you so very much for, for joining me here in Perusia World. It was my pleasure. God bless you. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Perusia Podcast Network, produced in partnership with EWTN Asia Pacific and Voice of Charity Radio Australia. To catch up on all Perusia podcast episodes, please visit perusiamedia.com forward slash podcast or subscribe to our podcasts in your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share with your family and friends. And for more information about everything Perusia, please visit our website at perusiamedia.com. God bless.